Okay, hello everybody. This is Scott Zimmerman with CLOC. Um, I also have several uh, listeners from CLOC participating in this call um, and that have helped uh, prepare this presentation uh, and the slides along the way. Uh, thank you for everybody for tuning in and listening. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the experimental design and applications of the green feed. And talk about uses of the green feed equipment, uh, how to lay it out in uh, experimental conditions, and some of the considerations that you should think about when you're using the green feed. This webinar is recorded, and if you contact us after the webinar, uh, after the recording saved and generated, uh, we can uh, provide you with the recording. Further, the slides will be made available at the end of the webinar series, and uh, we can send out the slides, the specific slides uh, from each webinar if you'd like them, but please contact CLOC for, for the presentations at the end of the webinar series. So, last week we talked about the theory, equation, sensors, and calculations of the green feed. Uh, again, you can, if you missed it, feel free to email us for the recording. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the experimental design and applications, and then next week, the final webinar for GreenFeed, we're going to talk about statistical approaches and literature review. We'll talk about today about some of the sampling considerations, but uh, we won't necessarily go into the theory of the sampling considerations until next week. Um, so stay tuned until then if you're more if you're interested in statistics and how to uh, create statistically valid samples and the theory behind that but this week we're just going to tell you the most effective way to set up the green feed and use it in a lot of different environments we also have the smart feed webinar series we talked about this a little bit last week uh smart feeds uh portable and practical systems to either measure control or control individual atom intake and or weight. We have the Super Smart Feed, the Smart Feed Pro with a gate. Uh, these both control intake and are being used for either supplementation or dietary work. We'll have a webinar on May 13th to discuss that. These, these webinars will be led by Ted Cunningham, who's our beef specialist. Uh, at uh, CLOC, uh, but just because these beef, these products can be used uh, for dairy as well. Uh, and then finally, on May 20th, we'll have a webinar to discuss uh, our ad lib feeding systems and weight measurements uh, that are being used uh, currently in a lot of different locations. So you're welcome to attend uh, any of these webinars and uh, we'll send out notices and go ahead and register as you get these notices. And of course, uh, we're developing an equipment grant for CLOC um, where we'll uh, provide um, CLOC uh, manufactured equipment to researchers based on a competitive uh, request for proposal process. Um, I, hopefully, uh, we'll start to outline what we expect in a request for proposal and uh, make that available next week in terms of uh, funding limits and uh, uh, some of the uh, purpose of the uh, equipment grant. Uh, so tune in next time. Uh, we'll also send out email uh, around uh, this equipment opportunity. So today's topics, we're going to talk about applications. Uh, how the green feeds have been used in a lot of different places around the world and how it's been set up. Uh, a lot of different applications can be set up differently uh, and green feed has been used in a lot of different ways. And so that will help us get our heads around kind of the breadth of all the different green feed uh, uses and how it can be effectively used in different environments. We'll talk about experimental design in terms of number of animals, number of samples needed, and um, effective use uh, of the equipment to create useful data. Um, 
And then of course, animal training, how do we get animals to use the systems? How, where do we set them up uh, so they can use them effectively? And some of the user feedback and experience that we've received from uh, Greenfeed over the years on how to make a, uh, a effective and positive user experience. So as we talked about last time, uh, and we're probably here because we all know what Greenfeed does, but it measures uh, gas fluxes of methane CO2 and optionally uh, oxygen uptake or uh, hydrogen emissions. It uh, automatically uh, dispenses a treat to the animals and when they visit the system, uh, the system's configured to measure mass fluxes from the animals when they're visiting the unit. Uh, the theory behind how that was done was discussed last week. So I'm not going to go into that in detail. This is actually an application with one of the first screen feeds. When you see these orange green feed shells, there are only uh, about 20 of those produced uh, in the world. Uh, there were some of their first units. And I think because they were some of the first units, they were the most widely photographed. So uh, every time you see an orange unit, that means it's been in the field quite a while. Uh, and of course, the, the newer green feed units have the green shell uh, and the newest units have uh, patterning on, on the stainless steel. So this would be a new unit uh, functioning uh, alongside uh, older unit. So applications and setup. So how is the green feed used in, uh, in different applications and environments? And how have people set uh, the, this equipment up? So that there's a lot of different ways people have used green feed in a lot of different situations. Uh, one option is to have green feed mounted on a hand cart. Uh, and often these are used in uh, freestall studies. So you're able to anchor the green feed, but also put uh, the, the legs up and uh, wheel the cart around to new locations by hand. Second is we offer a tie stall cart system where the green feed is actually mounted on a tie stall cart and it can be the cart can be easily raised and lowered and moved to different locations rather quickly uh, this is the most portable system finally of course green feed can be used on pasture and when we use green feed on pasture it of course has to be powered um, Green feed requires about 60 watts of powers, power to be used, which is about the same as uh, uh, old incandescent style light bulb. Uh, so the power requirements aren't significant unless, uh, of course, you're trying to operate on solar power in different environments in the winter. So in order to power the uh, amount of system on a system along batteries, I think it's matter on the on the trip with the solar system. And this trailer can be uh, portable and moved to different locations as needed. We also offer a customizable green feed, um, which is actually the internal, basically guts of the green feed. Uh, the sensors and the measurement platform and the uh, computer platform and all the equipment needed to support the sensors are mounted in a box along with our fan system. And this uh, system can be connected to any type. Well, I shouldn't say any type, but a uh, specifically uh, designed system to collect gases from uh, the mouth of the animal. Uh, it also could potentially be used in a chamber system. The flows we use are about the same as a chamber um, where it could function essentially the same as traditional chamber measurement equipment. We also offer the small ruminant system, which uh, would be meant for animals who typically emit less than 100 grams per day of methane. Uh, so lower emitting animals that are usually smaller. Um, so we've taken the normal green feed and downsized it. So we can talk a little bit about tie stall applications. Actually, 
a little bit of a history lesson. The first screen feed is sold to Penn State University, Dr. Arista, and actually uh, late, we sold it in late 2010 and delivered it in early 2011. So green feed has been around for uh, almost 10 years, at least in re research environments uh, and has grown uh, relatively quickly since the first unit. And actually this very first unit was uh, used in a tie stall application. Later on, we updated the green feed. Uh, the users of, of green feed at Penn State thought when you stand behind the unit, it's very difficult to see how the animal's head is actually staying in the green feed, which is one important criteria. Uh, so we put windows in a version of the green feed um, to allow users to see the animal use the green feed in the tie stall with, uh, without disturbing the animal. How tie stall systems are typically used, of course, animals are uh, positioned in the tie stall um, where they don't move. And instead of the animals visiting the green feed, the green feeds move to the animals. So the first criteria for sampling in tie stalls would be having labor, um, being able to have someone, and typically grad students are, and uh, thank you to all the grad students listening on this, but uh, grad students are perfect candidates to uh, operate the green feed and tie stalls. So the, 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 the person who's sampling the animals uh, would move the green feed in front of the animal for about five minutes. Uh, sometimes people like to dispense food to the animal on their own by pushing the buttons on the green feed and sometimes they rely on the RFID tag to be read and then they add the green feed dispensing feed for the animals. Um, after about five minutes, the tie stalls pulled away from the animal and is allowed to sample background air for about two to three minutes. Uh, and then after two to three minutes, the green feed system is wheeled in front of the next animal. And that process of sampling for five minutes and obtaining background for a few minutes is repeated until all the animals in the study uh, at that specific time are measured. Uh, typically, in order to make sure that um, we quantify the diurnal pattern and the change of methane over the course of the day, so we don't implement bias uh, on our sampling. The, the grad students will uh, stagger sampling at different intervals of, over the course of the day. And they even have to get up in the middle of the night and go sample the animals in the middle of the night. Um, so uh, if you have grad students that like to stay up all night and sample animals, this would be a perfect opportunity for you. Um, I feel like tie stall sampling, it produces very good data. There's been a number of uh, important papers published uh, on different feed additives and so forth that have been used in tie stalls. And because of the extra controls you have both for manipulating the animal in the tie stall in terms of its diet and maybe other treatments you're giving to the animal, plus um, the control you have of when you sample the animals, uh, the tie stall units typically yield uh, really good data and overall probably lower numbers of samples are needed in tie stalls as compared to a free stall system. The, the downside would be, of course, labor. Uh, you do have to sample the ans animals. It takes a person uh, a period of time to collect these measurements over the course of usually two to three to four days at staggered intervals over the course of the day. So it is, um, while you're sampling, uh, a little bit labor intensive. So next we have freestall applications. Uh, in freestalls, there's of course a number of different freestall, what I, what I typically call freestall environments. Uh, there's dry lots, um, there's, uh, dairy systems, there's uh, research pens uh, where you have specific groups of animals in a pen, 
Uh, and so typically these are in confinement situations where the animals are not grazing. Although we do have some studies where the animals are let out to graze during sometimes and then sometimes they're brought back with the green feed. So one application of the green feed, of course, is you might have a feed intake measurement system. In this case, uh, the researchers in France were using Kalen Gates. Uh, one of the Kalen Gates systems was removed and the green feed was just put into place in the alleyway. So the feed intake could be controlled and measured with the Kalen Gates. And then periodically throughout the day, the animals came to use the green feed. Um, of course, these uh, systems where you can measure feed intake or control feed intake and also measure med um, methane at the same time uh, can be really powerful and useful. If you do have a system to control intake or diet, you can potentially measure different diet effects with the same green feed uh, from different animals. Um, and so some of these systems have been used in different locations and yielded really uh, useful results uh, in a number of trials. Another way you can use the system, of course, is in a dairy. Uh, and sometimes dairy environments, particularly uh, maybe in Europe, but in highly crowded facilities, it can be uh, difficult to find a location to put the green feed. Uh, sometimes uh, one of the resting stalls is used uh, for the green feed and green feed is placed inside the resting stall and the animals can sort of visit it through that. It, it would be used in a dairy similar to like a concentrates feeder. Um, this is a green feed in a dairy in, in uh, uh, Sweden uh, at SLU. And I think this was uh, unit number 12 and 13. So really the first uh, freestall dairy experiments. And this uh, application in France was one of the first uh, applications uh, using it with beef animals along with feed intake and control. Uh, we also have freestall systems operating outdoors. Uh, one important consideration with uh, operating outdoors with the freestall systems is you still need the wind sensor. Wind, as we discussed just briefly last uh, last webinar, wind can dilute, cause dilution of the sample uh, from the animal. So the wind might come in and instead of the sample going into the green feed, it's lost into the air. And we really need wind sensors to help us adjust for wind effects. So if you have the green feed outdoors or even indoors where you might have an open barn uh, with a lot of draft, it's important to consider, consider whether or not you need uh, wind sensors. The wind effect, uh, depending on how windy it, can, it is, on average, uh, even in windy places, it's about 10% uh, sample loss, but it, it still is important to account, account for that sample loss. So if you have even the freestall system outdoors, um, or in windy places, it's important to collect wind, wind data. Um, it's not really needed indoors where the drafts are uh, controlled um, and there's not a lot of uh, air movement through the system. This would be a freestyle barn in Ireland uh, and one of the applications where uh, it was more difficult to find a place to find the green feed, but they uh, set up a gate in in the freestall system and place the green feed there for the animals to access it. Uh, and then we have a few other applications, uh, dairy, dairy, research dairy in Belgium. And I'm sure we have listeners who are thinking, oh, that's my green feed. So uh, thank you for all the creativity and the use of green feeds in these different environments. Um, uh, these systems in Belgium have been well used and uh, are con still continuously used. And then this is a uh, uh, research dairy in, in Switzerland. This application, and this is not unlike some users, uh, it can be difficult to find a place for the green feed inside the dairy under certain conditions. Um, 
And in those conditions uh, where there's maybe not a spot or an optimal spot, uh, a, a few research uh, applications, they've actually placed the green feed outdoors uh, and then had an alleyway leading to the green feed from inside to uh, for the green animals to use the green feed outdoors where there's more space and it also helps uh, prevent background dilution. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of set up the green feed, uh, either in line in the feed bunk, um, actually in the dairy. Uh, of course, it can be used outdoors. Uh, you might have to make space inside the uh, pre stall system to place the unit. Uh, and in dairies, it would be similar to a concentrate feeder. The other thing to note that in dairies with uh, concentrate delivery systems, the concentrate delivery pipes can be tapped into and then uh, drop down into the hopper so that a person doesn't um, need to go fill the hopper. It's automatically filled from the concentrate delivery system. So if you have an auger system to deliver concentrates, um, in many cases, you're able to connect a green feed to that uh, to prevent uh, having to fill the unit. Otherwise, uh, depending on how much you feed, uh, you need to place it in a spot where you can access the feed bin uh, rather easily and fill the feed at some interval. Depending on how much you're sampling, that will depend, but it might be every one to uh, seven days or so that you might need to access it to fill the feed bin. And then we have the pasture applications. Uh, this is uh, one of the first green feeds that was used in the pasture at Washington State University. Um, similar system we have today uh, with the panels and the trailer, except we've improved the trailer significantly. Uh, usually with our current trailer design for normal um, beef animals or even dairy animals, you can place the trailer in the pasture with, with the animals without having to worry a whole lot about protecting it. I know that some users have protected trailers different ways in, in many cases, but at this point, mostly everything that the animals can reach and chew on or destroy has been either shielded or protected somehow. Uh, animals will still of course, rub on any place they can rub, uh, but hopefully the, the trailer uh, system is resistant to damage from the animals. This is a green feed set up in Oklahoma, uh, where it was placed outdoors in pasture for several years, uh, kind of sampling animals over, over time. And we've also, when we send out these presentations, included links to the articles in which uh, uh, these pictures were published from in case you wanna learn more about how these specific researchers are using our equipment. This is a green feed in, or two pasture unit green feeds in Ireland. Uh, one thing to note about the solar setup is that in uh, Northern latitudes um, and by Northern for example, in the US, I would say anywhere north of, say, Texas. In the wintertime, solar power becomes a concern. Uh, with solar power in the summer, uh, depending on your latitude, but at latitudes where you have a lot of seasonal variation, uh, in the summer, you end up with uh, quite a bit more, more solar power than you need. And these systems operate quite well uh, in the summertime when you have longer days. In the winter, uh, when uh, the days are shorter and uh, so maybe it's cloudy or raining or something like that, uh, you can run into uh, problems operating and trying to measure animals uh, during the winter without uh, solar enough solar power. So even though this is only 60 watts, a light bulb, uh, obtaining enough solar power with these solar powers, panels uh, can be a problem. So generally we recommend that if you're at a uh, higher northern latitude or southern latitude, uh, 
if you want to sample in the winter, you need to find an AC power source to plug into the green feed. Uh, so the AC power sources could be, say, an extension cord can be easily plugged into the green feed and power the unit from an uh, line AC line power. Uh, another alternative is you can purchase a small generator, a gas generator. You can plug it right into the green feed, and then when you need to operate the system uh, and keep the batteries charged, you go start the generator, charge up the batteries, and then they will last for a day or two or three, depending on how much solar you get until you have to go charge them again. So, uh, that, and the other consideration is that if you're at a very cold climate in the winter, the intake manifold will actually freeze up um, or it's below uh, freezing for a period of days. And that prevents a system, actually all of the little holes in the manifold will become plugged and that prevents the system from sampling gases. So in really northern latitudes, we've implemented a heating system for uh, the feed tray to prevent ice buildup uh, and heat allow green feed to uh, continue to function. It's been used uh, a fair number of use years in Canada and can work very effectively at sampling at say 30 or 40 below uh, Celsius. But you, if you don't have that heating system and you place it out in very cold uh, conditions, uh, green feed won't work effectively. And that heating system requires a significant amount of power. And the only way you can power that heating system is if you have an AC power source. There's no chance that these solar powers will keep up uh, to keep the manifold thawed. So in the winter, using green feed at northern latitudes, you're going to need an external power source to keep green feed going if you want to sample in the winter time. Uh, Switzerland, it seems like they always take such nice pictures. Uh, this is another green feed in, in Switzerland. Uh, and again, you can re re read uh, about these applications. Uh, we provided a link. Uh, this is a very well, uh, in my opinion, set up green feed system. Uh, with the correct alleyway design and uh, blocking panels. Uh, and we'll talk, talk a little bit about alleyway design and panels. Some of these uh, systems aren't optimal. Well, this green feed in Canada maybe isn't as pretty. Uh, it's actually set up very well as well. Um, so this would be a green feed operating in sort of a dry lot uh, with solar power. And then we get to what we call unconventional pasture applications. So we have had a few uh, applications where um, the user had actually AC line power wired out to the pasture. And in that case, uh, we can just plug the green feed into the power source and we don't need the larger trail system with the solar, solar power. Uh, I'm getting feedback. If you can, uh, can yeah, I'll, I'll mute it. Uh, Say, uh, remind them happy Earth. Uh, you're breaking up. Anyway, uh, so this would be a, uh, can you please mute? You're getting a lot of feedback. Uh, this would be a uh, green feed system in Brazil uh, where it's plugged into AC line power that's run out into the pasture. Uh, then, uh, in New Zealand, uh, of course, with uh, they, sometimes they have a certain significant amount of precipitation, even in the spring and sometimes in the fall. Uh, they had some luck with uh, AC gas power generators. So they uh, purchased the green feed, built their own trailer system, and then we actually mounted a gas power generator onto the green feed that would automatically start when the battery gets low. So in this case, instead of solar, uh, when the battery went low, the generator would turn on and recharge the battery uh, and keep the green feed going. Um, uh, so that's another possibility if you were trying to sample in conditions where solar power was uh, more difficult or you had other considerations. 
Of course, uh, grain feed with a small ruminants that can be used for sheep. Uh, this user uh, supplied a trailer and a panel and uh, the green feed was used to sample sheet and pasture environment. We typically, because of the voltage considerations uh, and some challenges we've had with uh, users supplying their own solar system, we, uh, we require you to purchase a solar box for the green feed which supplies the batteries, the charging equipment, um, the charge controller, the AC, uh, DC uh, equipment. Uh, and then we can also supply the solar panels so that you plug into the charger and charge the, the batteries that run the machine. Um, and then of course, this is a, a green fee system in a free stall in Australia. And then uh, we do have one user in Oklahoma using the green feed with goats. I saw that you're actually on the call. Thank you for uh, testing the system with goats. Uh, of course, a couple of considerations with goats is goats climb on everything. So this user did uh, build a uh, fence system around the trailer, otherwise, goats would have climbed onto the trailer and who knows what else goats would have done. So uh, with goats, it probably is important to consider climbing and uh, chewing. Uh, and uh, also the other thing to note that was interesting in this application, in order to make the alleyway narrow enough so goats wouldn't uh, try and scoot in and steal other people's feed, how narrow the alleyway was made. It's a very narrow alleyway to uh, preclude uh, other goats from entering the, the green feed. Uh, and this researcher actually in uh, the free stall built a hole for the front of the green feed uh, to keep other animals out. And then animals would stick their head into the hole and into the green feed and use it. Uh, there's a couple other applications of the green feed to consider. Uh, we actually, one of our first uh, tested research applications was a green feed in Michigan State University. Uh, so we uh, built, actually built a green feed into a milking robot. Uh, here's the, just the green feed sampling part of the green feed and this, and then we designed a special intake manifold in the robot where when the animals came to use the milking robots, they would put their head into the system to eat the concentrates and we could measure head position and uh, collect air samples from the animal. One, one consideration we've had some other users uh, or potential users ask if we could use green feed and other types of robots. Some robots can be uh, relatively difficult to get an undiluted, to collect an undiluted sample where, as we talked about la last time, head movement can be an issue. And also if the, the, the specific design of the dairy robot is not enclosed enough, we get a lot of unpredictable dilution and can't effectively uh, collect the air and no dilution rates. So uh, if you wanna use green feed in the milking robot, um, Right now, the only robot that we recommend using is the Lely A3 because it is enclosed uh, and relatively easy to retrofit. Um, we found that though in a lot of cases, even if the users can't use the system in a robot, uh, purchasing the free stall green feed, it allows them more flexibility anyway because they can move the green feed to different locations and uh, are not restricted to one specific robot location. Um, and another consideration with a robot is that some animals head movement is a lot harder to control than it is in the normal green feed because they can just put their head in, pull it out, put it in, pull it out. Where with a normal green feed, they have to commit to it and actually have to step out. So we find some animals move their head like this all of the time in the robot and are very difficult to sample. So there is uh, some animals in the robot that just can't be sampled where we probably can sample effectively a higher percentage of the herd with a normal freestyle unit. But still these uh, researchers have used these effectively 
in a couple different locations. Um, and of course, we have this system uh, with green feed that's customizable. So this is the guts of the green feed with the air collection system and the computer system. Uh, so the animal put, puts its head into the machine. Uh, the air is collected from the animal, uh, routed through the pipe into the machine and out. In this specific case, we actually built a, a, a feed intake measurement unit. So this, these units measure feed intake at the same time they measure uh, gas fluxes. So the researchers fill the bins with uh, TMR. Uh, the animals come and use the system. We extract the gases and measure them. And this is a, a uh, system in New Zealand. And if you'd like to read about their system, uh, we've provided a link here as well. Um, the, the advantage of this system is, of course, you can measure feed intake and methane at, at the exact same time. Uh, some of the training issues with getting animals to use concentrates versus TMR are a little bit easier to deal with uh, because the animals have to eat. So you're going to always sample 100% of the animals very frequently. Um, one of the downsides is that the unit is restricted to the number of animals per opening because the animals are getting feed ad lib out of the unit. So we can typically sample about, um, you know, they're using these different ways, but not probably more than seven animals per green feed unit um, because of the feed intake restrictions. So the, the cost per animal uh, is higher uh, to measure methane than say using a green feed unit along with smart feed units because you can sample more animals with one green feed unit. So in terms of the number of animals per unit, uh, this will vary and users have had different experiences based on their applications. So these are sort of rules of thumb. Actually in pasture, we recommend actually a lower number of units per a lower number of animals per green feed than say in free stalls. And this is because in many pastures, especially the larger ones, the animals will travel in a herd and the time when they are around the green feed uh, is limited. So we're not able, when the herd of animals is near the green feed, we're not able to get as many of the animals using the unit. And then the animals might wander off to another part of the pasture and not be using the unit. So. We typically, uh, just because of constraints with animal uses, uh, usually the number of animals per grain feed is less in a pasture than like a free stall where they're not moving as a herd and the animals have access to it all the time. In free stalls, our rule of thumb is 20, uh, 40 at the most for you know sampling every animal consistently. Uh, Users have used them with more animals per green feed. Uh, the most ever attempted, we've had a few users put green feeds with over 100 animals per opening. Uh, even on pasture, we've had one green feed with 300 animals. But the, the important thing to consider is, as the number of animals per green feed increases, the use of some animals will decrease or you won't be able to sample them, especially the shy animals. So some of the shy animals won't have the opportunity to use as often the green feed as some of the more aggressive animals. And as you increase the number, the proportion of animals that aren't going to access the unit uh, de de decreases. So even if you have a lot of animals per unit, you usually can collect data from you know, 20 to 40 animals, even if you had 200 animals with a green feed. Uh, so you still can collect measurements and estimate herd averages and animal and averages for those animals, but there will be some animals that you can't measure. Another consideration is that, especially in dairies with uh, variable backgrounds, if the animals are always continuously using the system, uh, it, as we talked about last time in the webinar, it can be hard to sample the background if there's no breaks uh, during the day to or not enough to estimate what background conditions are. So if the green feed's always a very busy place, you can't get a background. Um, 
one way to resolve that is decrease the number of animals per unit. So in free stalls, typically where the animals are confined, they'll find the green feed. Uh, the location doesn't seem to be particularly significant. Of course, you know, that's not without exception, but by and large, if you put the animal, put the unit anywhere in the free stall with the animals, they're going to find it. Uh, in a location where there's space, so you have to find a location, we talked about that. And then we'll talk about the alleyway design in a minute. Uh, in a pasture, the location and placement of the green feed is uh, important. If you put the green feed in a location in the pasture where it's hard to access, uh, sometimes uh, animals will not visit the green feed very often. Um, and generally, as the paddocks are smaller, and you put the system in the pasture with the green feed, animals will use it more and more. But in larger pastures where animals spend time away from the unit, um, uh, location is something to think about. But on the other hand, sometimes the animals can get imprinted on the green feed. Uh, and where green feeds placed in the pasture might affect the grazing distribution a little bit. Um, so it's a it's sort of a trial and error. Are the green feeds used to it and following the green feed or do we have to put the green feed so they learn how to use it? Um, one thing is you do have to put the green feed in the field with the animals. Um, if you put say the green feed down a muddy path three or 400 meters um, compared to a green pasture, uh, they may not travel long distances to use the green feed when they have good feed quality in the field. That might change if you have poor feed quality, the animal might uh, be more apt to come, come to the unit. So there's some experimentation that needs to occur. Uh, often in large pastures, people will place uh, the green feed near water when, when they can. So in terms of the alleyway, the alleyway is an important um, design aspect of the green feed and setting it up is important to obtaining good data. Uh, one, of, one of the most important aspects to alleyway designs is having the alleyway narrow enough that two animals can't get into the green feed at the same time. If these, this alleyway is too wide, one animal will force its way in and then all of a sudden the green feed's measuring emissions from two animals. Sometimes we can identify that and remove the two animal data, but say this animal is only in partially and we're not reading its RFID tag, sometimes it can be extremely difficult to distinguish two animal data from one animal data. We can tell when it's happening uh, and talk to you about it, but we can't necessarily fix the data if two animals are frequently accessing the unit. So it's important to have the alleyway narrow enough so that animals can't get into the unit um, or two animals can't get into the unit. The other consideration with the alleyway is, especially for cattle, the longer the alleyway is, the length uh, will tend to affect use to some extent. So if you have a very narrow alleyway where the cattle have to squeeze into and maybe touch their sides uh, and it's long, the animal might start to feel constrained and be, some animals will be less uh, apt to really use the green feed. So really the optimal alleyway design probably goes back to the haunch of the animal and is narrow enough so it doesn't actually squeeze the animal or barely contacts the sides, um, but not wide enough so two animals can get into the unit. And I actually, from this uh, uh, goat application, uh, goats, probably are pretty uh, not as sensitive and are more used to squeezing in tight places. So this researcher had to actually make the alleyway very narrow to prevent two animals from uh, getting into the unit. There's There's been a number of different users who have set the alleyway up. They think there's no way two cattle can get into the unit. We see it in the data and, you know, sometimes there's some persuading and we have to show webcam images or data to 
prove that the animal is using the unit. So I think in some cases the alleyway might be need to be narrower than we think it needs to be, but not too narrow. So the alleyway design is actually probably the most important consideration to effective green feed use, both from the animal perspective and from the instrument perspective of obtaining good data. The other important thing to consider is, especially in crowded situations uh, where you might have a constrained background, if the animals can walk up on the outside of the alley and breathe into the green feed, that can cause us problems. So we actually, if the animals are crowding the unit, even from the outside and they're breathing into it, all of a sudden they're adding their emissions to the background. And uh, again, it can be difficult to sort out this animal's emissions from the true background conditions. So in those cases, we've recommended like covering the sides. So for example, putting a solid wood panel up along the sides of the alleyway so that uh, when the animal breathes near the unit, the gas can't immediately go into the unit, but instead is distributed into the background. Um, and this can be important. And I know I showed a number of slides where at the beginning where we don't have covers, but a lot of those pictures were taken at the beginning of the studies and they eventually added covers. But it's important that if you have animals crowding around the green feed that we're not measuring or adding emissions to the background from the animals. And usually like a two meter panel that's two meter high and the length of the green feed is uh, effective at solving that problem. Another way you can prevent animals from accessing the unit immediately is um, put a gate up, a triangular gate, just so that the animals can't access the unit immediately from the sites. Again, this will depend on the application and how you set it up, but in applications where this is practical, this is actually quite effective as well. And finally, um, and I showed a picture where the green feed is actually placed outside the pen and then there's gates. And so the animals have to actually walk into the pen and use the green feed. And they there's no access immediately around the green feed from the animal. Another very important thing to uh, consider with your green feed. So green feed has optical sensors when they're turned on, they're fragile. Uh, We've designed things so that under normal use, they don't break. But if you vibrate these sensors uh, actively or shake them while they're on, it can break the sensitive uh, optical sensors within the green feed. So it's very important to anchor down your green feed. Uh, sometimes the animals will learn that if they hit the green feed hard or lift it up with their head and drop it, they get a little bit more feed out of the green feed. Um, and they'll you and if it's not anchored they'll actually learn to shake the green feed to try and get more feed out and so we recommend anchoring the green feed very solid, solidly down so that it can't be lifted up and and shook so anchoring is very important and it's very important to anchor it so animals cannot lift it up in the air not only side to side but up so please anchor the green feed down if you install it in free solve systems so in terms of experimental design, uh, of course, if required, obtain the animal care uh, permit through your organization. Uh, there's differing, differing opinions on whether or not you need it for grain feed because grain feed's just providing a supplement to the animals and there's not really any invasive uh, uh, effects on the animal from using the green feed. But uh, in, in cases where it is required and you think it might be, uh, of course that would be depending on the rules you have for your institution. But we've had both green feed used without animal care permits and green feed use with them. So it's just important to consider that. Um, and if, if it can be uh, convinced that it's just providing a treat and not affecting the animals, sometimes you can uh, not need a permit, but please, uh, uh, if you need that, work on that with, depending on your local rules. Um, you need intact cattle. So 
what we found is the animals that are cannulated, the cannula can leak gas into the air. And when cannula, when gases are leaked into the air, they are not coming out of their mouth. So we tend to not get reliable, accurate measurements with cannulated animals. Um, the exception would be tie stalls where you can very carefully control things. Um, and we have a special attachment that we can lay over the cannula in tie stalls and actually collect the gas from the cannula and route it into the green feed and measure it. Um, but in, in free stall or pasture applications, if you have cannulated cat, cattle, um, uh, they probably won't provide accurate measurements uh, from gas fluxes in green feed. In terms of trial design, uh, of course, there's different uh, statistical designs that users use. The most common are, uh, uh, of course, crossover designs and random block designs. Uh, in crossover designs like a Latin square, typically you need fewer animals because you're running the animals through different treatments. So in general, of course, these are rules of thumb. And uh, we often have questions, well, how many animals should we use? Um, the rule of thumb is eight to 12 animals. Um, and then the minimum number of days is uh, 14 to 28 days uh, with roughly, uh, the first week or two is adaptation. Um, sometimes people sample longer or shorter, but if you can have stable conditions over a few weeks uh, or a month, uh, that's a very good use of the green feed where you can collect a number of measurements over a longer time period. Uh, in a randomized block design, we need a few more animals. Uh, the rule of thumb is at least 12 to 15. Uh, and again, similar to duration probably to the Latin squared. Uh, sometimes uh, users use these systems indefinitely or over months or sometimes years with this, with different groups of animals. Um, because green feed's you know, somewhat simple to use and set up and once the animals are trained, um, at least from the green feed use perspective, usually it's not a problem to sample these animals longer. Uh, one of the considerations with numbers of animals, especially in a random eyes block design, but also a crossover design to some extent, is the between animal variability and methane. So the lower the variability, the lower number of animals you need to show a treatment effect. So we found that under ad lib feeding, this isn't control feeding, but under ad lib feeding where animals are eating what they need in a production sense, the between animal variability, uh, will be between about seven and 12%. Uh, uh, and I, I posted a study from Huntington where animals had somewhat similar stage of lactations and intakes uh, for lactating dairy animals between animal variability and methane expressed as coefficient of variation was about 10% to 12%. And these universally are somewhat uh, consistent numbers unless you start to get into applications where you have a lot of differences in the animals. But if you have a similar group of animals, age, stage of lactation, or beef, or beef animals that are similar group by weight or cohort, um, this eight to 12% coefficient of variance is pretty predictable with between animal variability. So if you say had 10 animals in your study, uh, coefficient of var variance of 10%, uh, uh, about the 95% confidence interval in the average dimension would be about plus or minus 6.2%. Uh, so that's some rule of thumb if you wanna, uh, and then their statistical packages will actually predict the number of samples you need and number of animals. But uh, if you use this 10% number for ad lib animals, um, uh, it's not a bad rule to go by if you want to determine how many animals you need to see a treatment effect within two different groups of animals. Uh, one other point, budget for a few extra animals than you think you need. Um, sometimes animals won't use the green feed or you might have other circumstances. Um, 
uh, and to be safe. So sometimes people will budget for 20 or 30 percent more animals than they think they needed to start with. Green feed uses the standard uh, low frequency ear tag. Uh, this would be an all flex tag, but it can use half or full flex do tags. These tags are usually available uh, in most places and easy to get. We can supply the tags uh, as well if you need it, um, but it's just a simple RFID ear tag. Some users uh, have a collar system with a RFID identifier in the collar. Greenfeed can read low frequency collars. Um, there's some brands and manufacturers that can't read and some brands and manufacturers it can read. Um, so if, if you have a collar with an identification source and if you wanna use it, contact us and we can work with you to make sure that uh, it's gonna be compatible with Greenfeed. One other point in terms of Greenfeed interference, people have asked, well, if I have different kinds of tags that are in diff different frequencies. Oops. Uh, uh, if I have different types of tags at different frequencies, will they work uh, or interfere with the green feed unit? So like an activity monitor or uh, uh, say a Laylee uh, caller or something like that. We have not found any problems with interference from other types of tags being on the animals at the same time and we're still able to read the low frequency tags. And most systems, because these low frequency tags are widely used, most systems that use other tags are also not affected by these low frequency tags. So uh, usually tagging is not a big problem. So the the duration, uh, especially on grazing, are affected by your objectives. There's not sort of one size fits all, uh, but usually on pasture, we like to sample for, have an adaptation period and then sample for probably two weeks or so in order, order to get the number of samples we need. Uh, in some cases, users have sampled over a month or two uh, and generated uh, published, uh, actually very good published data. Um, the other thing to consider in grazing is in grazing, sometimes it can get be a more difficult to get the animals to use the equipment and is high of proportion of the animals to use the equipment. Uh, one of the most effective training schemes on pasture is to take the green feed and put it in a dry lot, make sure the animals have to access the green feed through the dry lot to get food, and then take the green feed out to the pasture. And once the animals are accustomed to it, percentage that will use the green feed. But if you take the green feed and you put it out on the pasture, uh, users have found mixed results in terms of the number of animals and the percentage of animals that use it. But if there's some pre-training that occurs, a much higher proportion of the animals will use it. Okay, so in terms of strat sampling, uh, again, we're gonna get into some of the theory and statistics behind the sampling in the next uh, 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 webinar where we will actually discuss diurnal patterns uh, and also different sources of variation in methane from cattle. So we're not going to discuss the theory, but we're gonna discuss the findings in terms of how we sample effectively. So in terms of the number of samples, um, if you collect very few samples from one animal, the uncertainty with the sample, with the average is quite high. So typically we found 20 to 30 measurements are needed to have a reasonable average for that specific animal. Now people will ask, how many times a day do I, do I sample? We look at it typically as how many times over the course of an experimental period do we sample? We found the number of samples over the period when things are consistent are much more important than obtaining X many numbers of samples in one specific day. So typically animals, their visitation will be spread over the course of the day. They're allowed to access it multiple times and we'll have an accurate measurement of the diurnal pattern provided that we can get 20 to 30 measurements over the course of the study. Um, and 
the bias or error associated with that sampling is actually quite low. Again, we'll discuss that uh, theory in the next uh, WebEx and actually show diurnal patterns and discuss error. But just take uh, take our advice that if you collect 20 or 30 measurements per animal over your measurement period, that will be sufficient to quantify emissions for that animal. You can sample more or more frequently. Um, typically, there's a point though of diminishing returns where the uh, uncertainty of the average doesn't diminish significantly with more samples. Uh, in all, the if you were to say visits per day, two to four visits per day, um, that allows you for 20 to 30 measurements over the course of one to two weeks. Uh, and there are many publications with one to three visits per day. So next is the sampling length. You can modify through the green feed interface, the number, uh, the amount of feed the animal gets and how it's dispensed over the course of their visit and how frequently. So green feed, with green feed generally, the animals only stay with their head inside the green feed when there's feed there. That's uh, by and large the case from almost every green feed. If there's not feed being delivered in the unit at some small interval, the animals will leave and we can't collect samples. So we basically control their visits through uh, the number of drops we give, the time between drops, and the time between each feeding event. So generally, we set it up so that the green feed delivers between four and eight drops every 30 to 45 seconds or so. For high producing cows, sometimes we have to deliver more frequently and sometimes for smaller animals, uh, for smaller cattle, we can deliver less frequently. Uh, generally, we aim for three to five minutes of sampling. And we found that, again, sampling but, but beyond five minutes has diminishing returns. If we can collect a three to five minute sample, that provides us a valid estimate of emissions for that time. Uh, in some cases, on like forage diets, we only actually need to sample twice, two minutes. Um, and sampling more longer than two to three minutes if they're erecting all the time, again, again, has diminishing returns. If the visit is very short, we have uh, other issues. And so generally we don't recommend in even including outputs less of uh, visits less than uh, two to three minutes with head into the machine. Uh, if you have a low gas producing diet, um, like say a concentrate diet or say a restricted diet uh, amount that's uh, less than maintenance or similar to maintenance, uh, it's possible you might need to sample longer because animals won't erectate as frequently. So on these high producing diets, animals will erectate every 45 to 60 seconds, but when gas reduction is, gas is produced, uh, is not as produced as much by these different diets, the animals will not erectate as frequently. And um, if the animals don't erectate frequently, it's better to sample longer so that we can have a true estimate of emissions. So as far as bait, uh, you have to use a pellet, I believe with a diameter of less than nine millimeters. If you use bigger pellets in the green feed, it can jam it. We have a clutch mechanism in the green feed so that even if it gets jammed, it won't get broken. Um, but still the pellets will jam and it won't dispense and you won't be able to collect measurements. So generally we just, we recommend smaller pellets of like nine millimeters or less. Um, and sometimes uh, you have to experiment with your pellets to make sure the animals like them. If the animals won't eat the pellets out of a bucket, it's placed in the pen, they're not gonna eat the pellets out of the green feed. So the animals have to like them and what they like and what they'll, what types of pellets they will come to will depend somewhat on their normal diet uh, and it will depend on the quality of the pellet um, and the taste. Um, usually we found alfalfa pellets work pretty well 
universally, even like on high concentrate feedlot diets. Um, but uh, people have tried a, a different formulations and eventually have found pellets on most diets where animals will be attracted to them and, and come eat them out of the green feed. If you have questions about your application, uh, we don't always know the pilot formulations, but if you say I have this application, email us. We can probably point you to a researcher who had a similar application. You can ask them about the pellet formulation they used. Uh, generally, the pellets, we like to dispense a small amount, so it's not a significant part of their diet. Um, hopefully, the amount of pellets we dispense is going to be less than, say, 10%, hopefully even sometimes less than 5% of their Total diet intake. Um, but if you're uh, concerned about the effect of methane production from your pellet, uh, think about your formulation and how it can be somewhat similar to your normal diet to reduce interference from the pellets. Animal training. So how do we get the animals to use the green feed? Of course, I included these pictures because uh, sometimes even under the best intention, animals uh, and cattle have their own ideas about how to use uh, equipment and where to put their head and what to jump over. Um, but animal training will depend a little bit on your animals. In freestyle systems with like say dairy animals that are very used to getting handled, they're very used to using concentrate feeders. Generally, all you have to do is put the green feed with the animals in the freestyle and they'll figure it out. Um, so uh, some animals can become strictly quickly trained without any active training. Uh, wild animals that are not around machinery a lot um, tend to be a little bit harder to train. Animals that are on a big pasture, not around the machine as often are harder to train. In those cases, uh, we would recommend either the dry, dots, dry lot situation where we're acclimating the animals to the green feed or accept that in your study, if you have a large number of animals and you just put it out in the pasture, a, fewer, a lower percentage of animals will use the green feed. The other thing is that, again, with animal training, uh, the animal use is completely controlled by the alleyway rather than the green feed. Uh, if you just put the green feed out in a pasture and let animals to passively use it uh, without an uh, alleyway, animals will use it. Uh, generally, they're not scared of the green feed itself, although they could, they could be a little startled about the pellets or so forth, but they would acclimate to the green feed. But the problem is you do need an alleyway. So sometimes users will remove the alleyway, let animals use the green feed, get accustomed to it. And of course, when you don't have the alleyway, you have sometimes multiple animals trying to use the system at once and pushing and maybe a lot more uh, competitive behavior. Um, but if once they learn that there's feed in there, you can put the alleyway on and then you will, probably will have some effect on some of the shire animals, but animals might be more inclined to use it afterwards. So there's been a lot of different uh, training approaches. Um, again, there's not a one size fits all because sometimes it's very easy uh, to train animals um, and sometimes it's more difficult. If you have questions about training or use, uh, when you're using the Frank Green Feed, uh, please contact us. Another point is in, in tie stalls, when you wheel the system in front of the animals, your grad student wheels it in front of the animals, uh, there's also an acclimation period that needs to occur in tie stalls in order to get the animals used to the equipment in front of their tie stall and for the animals to learn that there's feed inside the unit. Uh, and so plan even in tie stalls for an acclimation period so the animals can become used to using the green feed. Um, we've had some people with animals that don't use the green feed actually force them to use the green feed. And they once they learn there's food in there, they'll start to use it. Uh, some animals uh, are more difficult to train and maybe you need to not forget them. Um, there's a wide uh, spectrum of animal behavior around the green feed, even with, within the same herd. Uh, generally what rule of thumb we apply is 
25% of the animals will be very easy to train, get onto it very quickly. 50% uh, of the animals will adapt very well. So that's 75%. Um, and 25% of the animals will be more difficult to train. Again, this depends on a lot on your application, whether it's in a freestall or pasture, or the animal type, type uh, their conditioning. Um, but this is rule of thumb. So um, if you're in a situation where it's, you think there might be harder to train animals and you're concerned about the number, uh, I would budget for 20 or 30% more animals than you think you need. Uh, in other conditions, you can get all the animals using it and it's no problem. So in terms of user tips, uh, one thing Pat mentioned last time was that uh, animals, we wanna keep their head in the green feed when they're using it. Uh, if their head's inside the green feed uh, and they're able to look out when they're using the green feed, sometimes they tend to pull their head out more. So we built these white sides, which are supplied with each green feed. And so when the animal puts their head in the machine, that actually prevents the animals from seeing as well out of the machine and keeps their focus on the feed. Uh, generally, we don't find that these white sides signif significantly impact use. And they're not, the animals aren't really bothered by it. It also helps a little bit to prevent sample dilution. Uh, so if you have the white sides and you're in an application where you can use them, we recommend to use them. Of course, if you don't have the alleyway in your training, uh, take the white sides out because if multiple animals try to squeeze in the green feed all at once, uh, it can put a lot of stress on the white sides and break them. Uh, but uh, it is something to consider and we do sell these with the green feed for a reason. Uh, generally, we would collect a little bit better quality data with the white sides. Um, <laughs> So your, sa your sampling period and the amount of feed needs to be balanced with your experimental goals. Um, for example, do I wanna sample four times per day and feed more because the animals are visiting more frequently and versus once or twice a day where the animals are getting less out of the green feed. I collect fewer measurements in that day, but if I have a long enough duration, I still could collect 20 to 30 measurements. So, you have to sort of balance that out. Um, there's again, not one size fits all. You can sample more frequently if you think things change more and you're able to get the animals there and it's important for your study. Or in some cases you can sample less frequently, have a longer measurement period in order to get the 20 samples. Uh, and that also reduces the amount of feet per day per animal. So um, that's something there's not a hard and fast rule around that. Um, but you, you can consider altering the feed delivery and interval um, based on the constraints in your study. Um, we recommend to strictly follow our calibration procedures. Um, it's the better the calibration is, the better quality the data is that you collect. So we recommend for the auto calibration every three days or so. There's still a few users using manual calibration. We recommend for them to uh, calibrate before and after a sample period. But in auto cal, if you have a three day auto calibration sampling interval, that's definitely enough to collect good data. Um, and the auto calibration and sample inter uh, testing interval is actually set up on the website and completed automatically by the unit. Uh, in terms of the CO2 recovery test, please complete those once per month or possibly before or after your study if it's shorter than a month. It is important to have a regular uh, CO2 recovery test. And uh, if the CO2 recovery tests aren't completed, uh, so it, it potentially could become more difficult to reconcile the data and have accurate data. Uh, of course, we talked about having su sufficient time to sample the backgrounds. And this is affected by the animal uh, visit distribution, if they're in it all the time, and also the variation in the background. Uh, so that's also definitely something to consider. Some animals, a few of the animals, um, 
And again, it depends on the application, but will be harder to train to use screen feed. Um, training can increase their use, or if you don't wanna to go to extensive training in specific animals, budget for more animals than you might need. Uh, once the animals learn that feed is in the green feed, uh, they will use it. Um, if you have 20 to 30 measurements over two weeks, there's some users that say there's no use since collecting more than two weeks of data. That's, that's sufficient under uh, a uh, common uh, trial testing period, say with a feed additive. Of course, there's other users using this for genetic variation uh, where potentially you want to sample longer or potentially if you have systematic changes or changes over the course of a seasonal period where you might want to set sample long, longer. So it just, it depends. Um, and we're happy to provide input on an experimental trial if, if, if you have questions. So tips for using our user interface, and we won't go into the user interface on this um, webinar series, uh, but if you need have questions about how to use the user interface or what's included, feel free to email us and we can set up a personal WebEx and help you use the interface. Uh, sometimes, depending on the internet connections, can take a few seconds to load the interface. So be, be patient. Um, the slower that your internet connection, the longer it will take to load. Uh, all of the dates are presented in American style. So uh, year, month, day, instead of year, uh, day, month. So uh, the month and the day are reversed. So just be aware of that when you use the system. Uh, make sure you identify the unit. So for the users that have multiple units, you need to select one, and then you, you can modify the constraints of how that unit is controlled. Uh, and of course, again, if you have questions, let us know. So that's our webinar for today. Uh, we'll turn it over for questions. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, we have about, uh, I'd say, 12 or 15, 12 to 15 questions. Um, the first one is, um, can we use mash rather than pelleted feed for feeding animals using the green feed? Uh, I'm not sure what match means. Uh, oh, mash. Oh, mash. gotcha. Okay, mash, yep. Uh, yeah, so like a dusty or, uh, so there's a few uh, considerations. Uh, I would use a dry feed, and if you use a dusty feed, it can uh, go into the air filter and clog it very uh, frequently. So the dustier the feed, the more it will go into the air filter and clog it. So, uh, and if it's wet, it might uh, like not able to flow through the unit. So generally, we, rec we recommend non-dusty pellets. I forgot to mention that, but uh, if you have dusty pellets, then uh, you do have a lot of problems with the air filter. Okay, this question came in uh, when you were going over the um, power issues during the winter. So um, they're asking, could you repeat the alternatives during winter time for the generator and solar? Um, can, you, can you, so it's the question is, can you repeat the alternatives? Yeah, the, the, the actual text is, could you repeat the alternatives during winter time? But that came in during the power um, topic. So I think so, she's wanting power alternatives. Okay, so alternatives to power in the winter when solar power is scarce. Uh, you can get a handheld generator, um, like an AC generator where you put gasoline in it, you pull a cord, you plug it in. Um, that will charge the batteries for a day or two. Maybe longer if it's sunny, that will augment the power. Uh, but uh, you could get in the habit of, in the morning, starting a generator, plugging in, charging it, the batteries up for an hour or two, uh, either letting it run out of gas or disconnecting the generator. Uh, the other option is to 
um, just get a, a extension cord and plug it to into AC line power if you have that available. Those are really the two most effective options at this point. Uh, people have tried like exchanging batteries and things like that. Uh, batteries are heavy, they're hard to move. You're always dealing with trying to charge them. Uh, it's, we, I wouldn't say moving batteries in and out of the green feed is uh, the easiest solution giving other alternatives. Okay, next question. If we buy a pasture ready green feed on a trailer, can it be removed and mounted to a tie stall or hand cart for indoor applications? Uh, yes, any of the, once you purchase the green feed head, uh, you can move it to any cart, um, really with four or five bolts uh, and plug, plug it into a cart and use it uh, in different applications for sure. All right, next question. Can the green feed used for cattle, the big units, also be used for sheep and goats, maybe with an extra step, stair for the animal to reach the bin? So, uh, no, um, that's a good question though. Uh, the problem is that uh, we, so green feed has a fan, it collects the gas and dilutes the gas. Um, if, and then we've really tailored that fan to the, to dilute the gas to levels we can measure effectively with our concentration sensor. So our concentration sensors have a lower level where they're effective. If a smaller animal uses a big green feed, the gas emissions will get diluted too much and we might not be able to effectively and accurately quantify the gas emissions because they're below the sensitivity of the concentration sensors. So the, the small animal unit is scaled down it has a lower airflow rate, but the dimensions are made such that we create the same capture velocities. Um, so we're able to sample smaller animals that are emitting less methane accurately. So it's not just a not just a problem of the animals accessing the unit, it's the problem of having adequate sensitivity in the unit and having specifically designed airflows for the lower emissions that smaller animals produce. Okay, next question. Um, and this came in before you gave some suggestions on increasing visits, but uh, maybe you can elaborate. Uh, do you have tips to increase visits to the pasture trailer green feed? We experienced significant, significantly less visits in the pasture compared to the barn units. Uh, that's a good question. I, usually in the pasture, um, uh, it's harder to get visitation. I would agree with that. I think that the things that you might try to increase your visitation are look at the alleyway design. Is there something in the alley that it's either too long or too narrow that's preventing the animals for, from being comfortable using the unit in the pasture? Um, the second thing is that, uh, you know, maybe it's the feed quality from the green feeds affecting your visitation. In other words, when they're on pasture eating, they find the pasture more tasty than what you're offering in the green feed. Um, where if they come in the barn, they don't have anything to do, it's easier to access the green feed and get a treat. So uh, I think that those are probably, provided the animals are acclimated to using the unit and trained, and they don't want to go to it in pasture, I would look at the feed quality and the alleyway design. Okay, next question. Um, can you repeat the robot models um, that are best for fitting green feed? Oh, sorry. Uh, really the only model that we uh, can easily fit the green feed into that we found is the Lely A3 uh, milking robot. Uh, the A3 is the last generation of Lely units, the newer Lely uh, milking robots, the AFAR 4 are quite open and harder to uh, to modify or possibly impossible. Okay, so the next Le question. Lely A3. Next question, uh, she referenced a slide, slide 26. 
Um, and the question is, covering the sides with wood doesn't stop the RFID tag from the cow that is next to the green feed from getting recognized. Is there a solution for this? Um, that's actually a good point. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it depends a little bit. So the RFID read range uh, of the green feed is, uh, what is it, Mike, 23 centimeters? 24 at best, yeah. 24 centimeters. So, so any tag, provided you have wood sites, any tag that's gets within 24 centimeters of the opening could potentially be read and interfere with our measurements. I would claim that if an animal's getting within 24 centimeters of the opening, they're pro they could affect the uh, sampling uh, and contribute to the background. Um, so, I mean, I would look at your alleyway design, uh, how the wood is placed and seeing if the wood is more than 23, prevents access within 23 inches. You can always, if you're worried about that, can take a test tag, move it around the unit on the outside and see if animals can, their tag can get read um, and potentially uh, modify that area just to keep tags out of that. Uh, but generally, the animals sort of have to have their head pretty close to the green feed or in the green feed before that tag's easily read. Um, you might, maybe potentially you can get animals from the side or back or something reading, but um, if you have an alleyway, we haven't had it, at least that I know about, maybe a big issue. But if there's more of an issue, email me and I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, next question. Um, question about the number of animals recommended. Is it eight to 12 in total or eight to 12 per treatment? Uh, it would depend on if it's a randomized block or a, a Latin square, you need fewer animals. Um, and people ask the same question. They see, say, well, how many animals do I need to measure methane? And really, since uh, the better way to ask that question is, I want to see treatment effects of 10%, how many animals I need to be sure to different treatment effects. So if you have very small differences, you're looking to uh, measure between animal groups of say two to 3%, you're going to need a lot of animals um, given the 10% common uh, between animal variability that we see in normal animal groups. If you wanna look at treatment differences of 30%, you can reduce the number of animals sometimes significantly. If you run a randomized or a Latin square that can reduce further. What I would do is I would pull up statistical software use a between animal variability of around 10%, use that, and then the treatment differences I wanna be able to di differentiate and have your statistical program actually uh, predict for you how many animals you might need. Uh, eight to 10, 12 animals is sort of a rule of thumb that is usually sufficient in these treatment studies to differentiate treatments. All right, next question. Um, when you were doing an experiment where you received data on day level, meaning feed intake, milk yield, etc., preferably you would like to receive the CH4 data also on a daily level. Is, is it correct that it is not possible using the green feeds or you should analyze data on a week level? Uh, I, so animal, other animal data is going to be variable. Either milk yield, that's going to vary somewhat day to day. Feed intake will vary day to day um, uh, for specific animals. So there's always variability in the daily data. And typically the effects we look at within animals aren't daily effects. So we recommend averaging all of your data over like a, say at least a weekly period because usually the day to day changes are not uh, as important as longer term changes. Um, so I if, if it were me and I wanted to say have milk yield and maybe dry matter intake, I would average the dry matter intake over a week, the milk yield over a week, the methane over a week, and that will provide very uh, uh, 
ac that will provide accurate measurements of what's going on in that animal over the course of the week. But the day-to-day -day changes uh, uh, in most cases usually are as important. It's not to say you might not have a study, a professor studying some, some small quick change where it's more important. In that case, if you're concerned about daily changes, uh, I would sample very frequently with green feed along with your other variables. But usually that's um, not the case. Okay, we had one user that wanted to say, thank you, it was a lovely presentation, but they did have connection issues. And I just wanted to reiterate that we are recording this and it is available. Just contact us, um, email contact at sealocking.com and we can provide you with the link for that. Um, next question, uh, let's see. Or actually, it was just a comment. Um, we found the chime when feed drops um, is initially helpful in training animals, but had to turn it off after they got the hang of it. The chime would attract everyone to the unit. <laughs> I believe that. I so I that's a good observation. I think uh, it, it's always helpful to periodically watch the animals use the green feed and see if you can modify, uh, you know, how it's behaving to have accurate treatments and you do have the ability to control the chime, uh, turn it on or off, uh, depending how you need to. And certainly that I could see that case where you have very ambitious animals that really like the green feed. Okay, um, next question. What is your recommendation for anchoring green feed using a tie stall? Uh, the tie stall card is very heavy. Um, if I can find the picture. So this this is the tie stall card. Um, it's particularly heavy, and then when you release this um, um, system, it will drop all the way on the ground and be pretty solid. Um, and also with tie stall, there's always a person standing there moving the grain feed around. So we just recommend dropping the tie stall down uh, and setting it on the ground, and that person watching can make sure that animals aren't creating too much havoc with the green feed. Okay, next question. In grazing tropical conditions, they usually provide a concentrate twice a week after or before milking in the barn. Um, is there a possibility to provide the concentrate in three to five installments during the day via green feed located in the pasture? Instead, pellets, there will be concentrate provided via green feed. What was the end of that? I interrupted you. Um, sure, no, I was clearing my throat. Um, is there the possibility in, sorry, is there the possibility to provide the concentrate in three to five installments during the day via green feed located in the pasture? Instead, pellets, there will be concentrate provided via green feed. Um, you definitely can alter the visitation very easily with green feed and provide supplement at some interval and say if the animals visit green feed, how long they have to wait to visit supplement again. So that if animals like your concentrate and visited, you can control supplement delivery however you would like over the day. Um, of course, if you're providing a concentrate out of a green feed rather than like an alfalfa, and concentrates an important criteria for managing the animals, you would, it would also affect how you deliver concentrate in the barn. So you just, I think you have to look at the study and what the purposes are, but there's no problem altering the dropping of the green feed. And in fact, if you didn't wanna measure gases and just wanna have concentrate delivered at some interval in the pasture, we have other systems that can do that probably more effectively. Okay, um, next question. You mentioned that 20 to 30 samplings per experiment are enough. In a study with 8 to 12 cows, it could result that different cows are more frequently sampled during different times of the study. And with that small number of animals, um, could be that they not, sorry, that they are not equally rep represented among treatment groups over time. 
I think uh, that's a great point. Um, and thank you for that question or comment. Um, my feelings of the situation are is if the studies manage so conditions are somewhat consistent, um, exactly when you measure them in the study uh, probably isn't going to advise your uh, experiment significantly. Of course, if you're changing conditions all the time, you uh, say, go from one treatment to another, um, that the visitation during that treatment change could become more important. But if your conditions are somewhat consistent uh, and animals do, do use it, the 20 to 30 measurements does yield quite good results. Um, animals, we will find that some animals, actually the visitation in green feed is very different between animals. Some like to be in there all the time and some are less frequent visitors. So it's a good point that if you have a low number of animals uh, and then you have some animals that aren't visiting very frequently and you're not able to collect the 20 measurements, the low animals could skew the results for sure. Um, so that's why we recommend typically being sure that you have enough animals and some over budget. So, you know, maybe if you use a lot of animals, the few that don't visit won't affect the average of the animals as much. Uh, but if you're using a limited trial with a no limited number of animals, uh, it's important that some of these animals that are sampled less than 20 times, uh, we take a close look at. And in fact, statisticians have recommended just to exclude those animals from your results. Okay, next question. Um, on, on your opinion, um, Zebu, uh, Boss Indicus cattle, will be easier to train to use the green feed because they usually are more nervous, so to speak. Any previous experiments, experiences somewhere, Australia or Brazil? Do you want me to repeat that? Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I, um, I'm not an expert on which types of animals use which green feed. Um, you will probably see some differences in use between different animal groups. I, um, I would lean more on people using the green feed uh, in those tr tropical places with Zebu on their experiences with green feed. That, um, you know, right now I'm not, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how Zebu would compare to say an Angus or a Hereford or a dairy animal. So uh, that definitely could be a good observation. And I, I would say if you're using it for a specialized breed, um, here it says the Zebu adapted very quickly, then great, the Zebu work well. Okay, uh, next question. Um, Scott, you said that the alleyway had to be narrow, but cows even within breed can vary a lot. Um, for example, Holstein, um, can grow from 500 to 750. Um, now, oh, now and then, we have Holstein cows 1,000 gram or 1,000 kilograms. Would this put constraints on what animals can use? Um, I think where you run into a lot of trouble is, say, if you have calves or young animals mixed with cows, like adult animals. Usually, within groups of similar type. So managed animals, uh, even with like a lactating uh, Holstein or a down, down, if you had the uh, uh, other breeds mixed in, if they're adults, you can modify the alleyway to keep, so it's wide enough for your biggest animal, um, but narrow enough so that two smaller animals can't get in. Um, but you, you, really, you have to think about it, look at it, um, uh, but in most, research applications, uh, we've been able to find a pretty easy solution uh, for the alleyway width. Um, of course, we have had, uh, there was a, a one study I saw that their biggest animal couldn't fit in the alleyway, so they couldn't measure it. And if it's important to measure that big animal, I would make your alleyway wider and check to make sure it works for the smaller animals. And if you can't make it work for all of them, you'll have to figure out how to set up the alleyway to effectively measure animals. But it's it hasn't been a big concern, except when you have, say, young calves mixed with adult animals. 
Okay, next question. Um, can we update the manual calibration green feed unit to auto calibration green feed? Um, well, if you're a, a user, that means that uh, I, I would say contact us and we can uh, work out a solution. Um, generally, it's uh, a little bit tricky to update the manual with the automatic. Um, but there's other solutions and contact us. Okay, uh, one user says, it makes me wonder about if it would be more important to focus on the number per samplings per cow per day, instead of considering the whole study together. Um, generally, uh, that's, um, there's several papers out. Um, you, you email, and would like the papers, uh, let me know, but um, it's actually more important to consider the total number of samples than samples in a single day, uh, unless you have very quickly changing conditions. But in most trials that are carried out over the period of time, that are consistent for a period of time, uh, the total number of samples is much more important than focusing on collecting, say, six samples in a day versus three or four. All right, next question. If we forget to calibrate the CO2 gas, is that possible for us to still access the data, methane, after we are doing the calibration? Uh, so you can access data whenever you want. The data is processed and output, and it's reviewed by CLOC. Um, if the calibrations aren't done that need to be done, we'll be contacting you and asking you for calibrations um, before we process the data. Um, if you have an on ongoing study, uh, I highly recommend just to get it into your protocol to perform CO2 recoveries once a month. It's very, it can be very important. All right, this one kind of ties into a question a couple uh, previous questions ago. Back to animal size and animal weight, can the same unit be used for a 75 to 90 kilogram calf and its mother, a 600 kilogram cow, which are the weight ranges for small and big animals? Thanks. Um, I look at it more in terms, of course, um, weight can be tied to feed intake and feed intake affects methane emissions rates. So potentially we could look at it in terms of weight, um, but usually I am look at it in terms of methane emissions. So. Uh, the larger green feed becomes less accurate when you're sampling below about 60 grams per day. Um, so if you have animals, smaller animals or younger animals that aren't emitting methane at high rates, um, it's difficult to sample those animals. But once they get to a point where they're emitting over 60 grams per day, um, 100 grams per day, we can effectively measure them in green feed. All right, um, one user is asking, is it possible to increase light inside the feeding manifold? I tend to think that this may make animals less shy or afraid to use green feed. Window, battery charged lights installed inside? Uh, there is actually a light inside that can be turned on. Um, if you have questions on how to turn that on, uh, contact Mike uh, Billers and he can show you how it should be able to come on and stay on all the time. Uh, windows, uh, you know, I don't know. Sometimes shadows can cast on the units and that confuses animals as well. If you have a breaking pattern that uh, they see a dark spot, uh, that can affect visitation too. So I don't know whether or not windows would help, but if you want light, uh, there is a light in green feed. Um, if you wanted more light than that, um, you could contact us and uh, add, I, I think we could add in more lights. Uh, uh, we generally have very good use in uh, free stalls um, that are very dark. Um, and so maybe this is more of a pasture conditions question, I'm not sure. All right, next question. Um, grain is added manually to the metal bin placed on the green feed, right? How many kilograms can it hold? 
how much grain do you usually offer to each animal at each visit? Um, so that the hopper, I believe, can hold 75 to 100 kilograms based on the density of your feed. Um, so you, you, if you fill it up, you can put that much in, in it. Um, the amount of feed that's af offered per animal per visit uh, varies uh, highly depending on uh, the study. Um, so I think the lowest amount of feed that probably can uh, get away with in say a two week study is maybe a half a kilogram of feed per animal per day. Uh, of course that varies as well. Um, all the way up to some people have provided three to four kilos of feed through green feed. But usually uh, we still can have uh, adequate measurements depending on the animals, of course. Uh, but for like a beef steer or younger animal with uh, a half a kilo per day, um, uh, again, that varies a little bit depending on the animals and their total intake. One user is asking, how does green feed application improve productivity and profitability to justify deployment? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, a lot of green feeds to date have been used in research environments where um, the green, green feed cost is per animal and the ease of use um, when you consider alternatives is much better than any other alternative. It takes uh, much lower, lower manpower uh, to use the green feed um, compared to like say SF6 and it's easier to sample more animals for longer periods of time. Uh, so that's one big advantage uh, through these studies uh, and research that's been done with green feed. I think that there's been a number of solutions that will greatly increase profitability and sustainability uh, and these solutions have been researched using green feed. So I think green feed is going to have a significant effect on methane emissions in agriculture in the long run. Um, in terms of say a farmer using the green feed to measure methane, um, uh, I'm not sure under what conditions that could, could happen. Um, I wouldn't see widespread use of green feed in production as something as green feeds designed right now that uh, will be Come widespread by producers. Um, there are going to be some uh, progressions and some uh, advancements in green feed, and as well as what we know about it. And I think some of the principles we've learned using green feed through research can be applied to systems that measure gases in production and definitely help people be more productive, both finding more efficient animals. Um, Methane and CO2 and oxygen to some extent are affected by feed intake. Uh, so uh, methane and CO2 emissions are actually probably the best proxy we have for predicting feed intake on pasture. Um, and I think there could be some applications for using green feed to produce more efficient animals by measuring that graze better on pasture. Um, there's also some other uh, ben benefits uh, with other applications of green feed that could be indicative of animal health. But green feed as it is right now probably won't be used in that, but there are other alternatives that are being looked at. Okay, uh, final question is, <clears throat> what weight animal is generally associated with the 60 grams per day methane minimum? And this user also asked, what is grape nut or grass nut, sorry? So the easy question, what is grass nut, um, is uh, that's like a uh, basically a pelleted grass. So they take like a grass mis mixture, grind it up and turn it into pellets. Uh, in terms of animal weight associated with emissions, I so I'm being put on the spot uh, and I'm sure someone might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. But I would say one to 200 kilos is the cutoff for small versus large animal grain feed. Okay, we do have one final question uh, that came in. Um, is annual service contract a must? What happens if I don't have one? 
Okay, so we put a lot of work into the green feeds and in the theory um, slide deck in the last webinar, we explained how we uh, quality control the data. Uh, we provide free parts. Um, and part of the global standard program is actually the quality control from qualified people at CLOC to review the data and make sure that units are effective, are um, accurate, are operating effectively and accurately. Um, the green feed's a complicated machine. Uh, there's a lot of considerations in the calibration results um, and also in making sure the green feed is running. And um, so therefore, and also the advantage of providing um, parts and service to people. And unfortunately, we can't do that for free. Um, parts cost money, people cost money to review data and make sure that units are operating effectively and also to keep advancing the software and the use of GreenFeed and put, uh, we always are continuously improving the user interface and the code um, so that GreenFeeds operate more effectively and that costs money as well. So the, uh, to operate the GreenFeed, uh, the contract is mandatory, but it has a lot of benefits with the contract in terms of being sure that uh, the green fee data is standardized, uh, universally controlled, accurate, um, and the green feeds are functioning in a way that they need to be functioning. And also being able to fix any parts without uh, added expense. All right, that's it for all the questions. Perfect. Well, thank you for everybody for listening. Uh, again, we had a large number of attendants um and we have uh one more webinar next week uh in the meantime please stay safe and stay healthy um and take care of yourselves uh thank you again for listening and we're happy to answer any other questions by email uh have a good day bye